Presets. All right, let's finish a little earlier. Can we do without a break today? I don't know about your bladders. <laughs> I got a trained bladder, so. <laughs> All right. Um, well, of course you can always go. And if I feel like too many people are getting up, maybe I just get like a. You can do a speed pee. <laughs> okay. Who's, okay. Oh, there you are. Okay, sure. Good, good. And here, yes. yes. All right. Great. So we got to page, what was it? 61. All right. We finished pretension or deceit. Okay. All right. Again, like I mentioned this in the beginning, what is helpful is to just think, oh, do I have that kind of, does that happen to me sometimes? Am I aware of these mental factors? So, of course, that's the whole point of it, basically. Checking your own mind about having those emotions or not. Um, and maybe, sometimes we just don't notice. We just don't know. I mean, I met a person once who was really quite angry. I mean... I knew this person for a while, and this, he, this person was the loveliest person ever. But every now and then, this person would get really angry. And told, not knowing, this person was not aware that, I can say, he, he had that problem. It was so bizarre. He really didn't know. He, he said, once he told me, someone else had told him that he was angry. And he was like, they don't know me. I never get angry. <laughs> and he was sincere. He really believed he never got angry. And he didn't get angry often, but when he did, whoa. So, interesting. Mm. And so I'm thinking, oh my God, all this stuff in my, in my case, just the same thing, total denial. So, and not consciously, like just not aware of it. Mm. So that helps us to maybe bring it on to a more conscious level. Dissimulation. That is a mental factor that is a type of ignorance or attachment which, motivated by attachment to material possessions, status, etc., does not want others to know our shortcomings. Okay. So that's a little different. We had other ones before that were... Oh, wants to pretend that we possess qualities that we do not possess. That is different to not wanting others to know our faults, our shortcomings. Okay? Again, motivated by attachment to material possessions. Basically, have you heard of the eight worldly dharmas? Yeah. Yeah. Who hasn't heard of the eight worldly dharmas? Okay. So that is um, um, a kind of a summary, in a way, of usually our worldly concerns. So we... We are attached to gain, and we are attached to avoiding loss. Okay, we are attached to being praised, and we are attached to avoiding at all costs being criticized. We are attached to a good reputation, um, and by all costs, by all means, we want to avoid having a bad reputation. And we're and again attached to. Uh, not having, I mean, attached to not having a bad reputation. So really it's almost saying the same thing. And we're attached to pleasant experiences and cannot bear unpleasant ones. So it's, it's very interesting. Those, those Actually, if you just said take four. Take four. Gain, pleasure, reputation, praise. Okay? Gain, pleasure, reputation, praise. And then the opposite of those, trying to avoid those. So usually our actions are governed by those. Right? So material possession here means gain. Um, status here means reputation. And part of that is getting praised, of course, um, and having pleasant experiences. So those really bug us if we don't get those. I mean, you know, it's like I watch my own mind. It's so ridiculous. When I book a flight ticket that I don't even have to pay, and I see after it's been booked, a week later, it's cheaper. It bugs me. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, but it's, it's not just about all oh, the poor people who have to buy my ticket or whatever, right? It's about, like, I could have it cheaper. 
<laughs> it's just that, and if it's 10 euro, I can bear that. But up to 20, it gets difficult. <laughs> it's so bizarre. It's so bizarre. So it's like, and I watch my own mind, I'm thinking, come on. I don't even feel that, you know? And even other people, even if I have to pay for it, it's still, who cares? If I hadn't looked online, I would still feel like the best deal. <laughs> just because it's so good. It's totally ridiculous, but it's just my mind attached to a game, right? Or I feel like in a store they charge me two rupees more for the bananas, and I'm like, I'm never going to go to that guy again. <laughs> and I'm thinking, give it a rest, you know? Maybe he's got to bring take his kids through college, so why not? <laughs> it's just the mind automatically, right? Of course, pleasure there too. Pleasure is important. And then praise, right? I mean, like wanting to be praised and criticism, whoa, much harder. And of course, reputation, right? Wanting to have a certain reputation. And actually, like reputation, that is so, what's the word? Transparent? It's so, elusive. what is, but it? Elusive. Elusive, yes. So it's so elusive. Like, what is a good reputation? What is it? As if it was like, it was like this banner of good reputation kind of like put up. I mean, what is a good reputation? It just means every now and then, maybe someone says something good about me, right? And I mean, that's it. it you, they say it in a second, and of course, they're busy with other stuff, so it may just be, you know, a sentence or two, and then they're busy with their own life. And then <laughs> if I hear about it, I feel like I have a good reputation. I mean, that's it. No one else knows me. No one else cares. So what is that reputation, right? So again, it's so... With pleasure, all right, you know, there's definitely a, a moment of pleasure, okay. But repetition is nothing to be found, really, right? And for all I know, the other person could be lying when they say something positive, right? For whatever reason. So I don't even know it's true. So the thing is, it's it's so bizarre, that whole reputation thing. Um, and people work so hard for it, when in actuality, there's nothing really solid to be gained, and praise, come on, praise is not helpful. I mean, praise is helpful once you're a Buddha. Then those beings who praise you accumulate merit and you're really happy for them. But until then, right, until you, uh, unless you're totally low, but okay, then praise may be a good thing in that moment. But usually it's much better to hear our mistakes because then we can learn to remove them, Right? I mean, if, we, if we're a laundry pass and we want to wash clean clothes, we don't want to be praised for all the clean clothes we wash. We want to know which clothes still need some attention. I mean, we would want to continue with like getting it all clean, right? So Buddhist practice is similar. You want to purify your mind. You want to transform your mind. So criticism is great. It's great. So why praise so much? And so if we get that. And pleasure, if you have a lot of pleasure then you're exhausting your positive karma. It's almost like spending the money in the bank. You keep spending it in the bank, right? So, I mean, some pleasure, of course, is healthy and it's necessary, but this constant kind of like, if it becomes exaggerated, like just pleasure, can't bear any displeasure. I mean, sometimes displeasure, like unpleasant situations, they also exhaust negative karma, so it's good, okay? Right? Also becomes harder to renunciate samsara. Renunciation, exactly. Very good point. Renunciation to really get a sense, I cannot find lasting happiness within samsara. So if I experience some unpleasant situation, I'm reminded, oh, I need to get out of this. I'm in samsara. What is samsara? What is samsara, by the way? What is your own samsara? What's your own samsara? No, no. Are you in samsara? Yeah. What are you in? I'm an illusion. You are an illusion? <laughs> I'm an illusion. You are in an illusion? Yeah. What is that illusion? That I grasp to inherent existence. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in that... No, no. Actually, actually, not just a state of mind. Like Ketubji, for instance, he defines it in one of his texts on the... I think it's on the Pramanavatika, or is it his commentary on... Yeah, Pramanavatika. In that text, it says, the five aggregates, that's samsara. So, my mind and body, basically, that's my samsara. And your mind and body, that's your samsara. And since you're stuck in that mind and body, you're stuck in your own personal samsara. It's not a place, 
it kind of makes it sound like we were born in samsara. Maybe it would be better to say we were born with samsara, as in like with this mind and body, therefore we are in samsara. Does that make sense? So when we say the Buddhas stay in samsara, actually it doesn't literally mean they stay around us so we can see them with our own personal samsara. That's really what it means. It's not like a place so the Buddha is born in this world. Um, no, actually the Buddha is in this world, manifests in this world as an ordinary person because if you manifested he or she manifested with all their qualities, we wouldn't be able to perceive them. So they manifest in a way in which we can perceive them as ordinary, because we can perceive ordinary. So they manifest in that way, and of course the person needs to have the karma, of course, from their side, they must have the karma to perceive a Buddha. Some people were just never around. You know, maybe they were born as worms underneath the ground. Maybe, I, you know, I'm thinking I was not around at the time of the Buddha. So maybe I was just a worm underneath the ground. I kind of missed him. Every time I poked up my head, he'd just been gone. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, I mean, I'm, you know, if I'd been around and I would have learned the Dharma, I wouldn't have been stuck where I'm stuck right now. So never mind, that's fine. Um, I'm not happy about it, but I'm just thinking. So therefore, when we say the Buddha remains within samsara, it basically just means it's accessible to those people who have their own personal five aggregates samsara. Does that make sense? So that's samsara, the five aggregates, body and mind. So he's right when he says the illusion, but that's not enough. <laughs> he's, that's definitely the main uh, samsara, but it also includes your body. That's the result of this illusion, this, this wrong perception. Mm, great. Anyway, so you get a sense like we're stuck in samsara, and we're stuck in samsara not so much that we're really stuck. It's our mind that doesn't want to get out of it. Because we're attached to samsaric pleasures, we're attached to samsaric reputation, samsaric praise, and samsaric gain. So we're so attached to our little attached to our little samsara, we're like in a prison, kind of chaining ourselves to the wall while the, the doors open. That's us. <laughs> right? So we can't eliminate the misperception right away, but we can loosen it by applying these antidotes, although they're temporary, but in that way we start loosening our everything and we find a type of happiness that we haven't experienced before. And that gives us a taste for what is what is outside of the prison gate, basically. Okay? Does that make sense? So therefore to watch your mind, to simulation. So am I am is my motivation any of those four? They say eight, but really it's four. Just check what is my motivation. And it's great, it's only four. Simple. And usually you find one of the four. I always do. Okay. Haughtiness. Haughtiness? Haughtiness? How do you pronounce that? Haughtiness? Yeah? Okay, good. Haughtiness is a mental factor that is a type of attachment which, having taken to mind our accomplishments and good qualities, gener generates an afflictive sense of self-confidence. It's not arrogance yet. It doesn't have the same strength but it's kind of moving in that direction, haughtiness, okay? Like this, yeah, an exaggerated sense of self-confidence. There's a, there's a healthy one, and there's a slightly exaggerated one, being haughty, okay? Harmfulness is a mental factor that is a type of anger which wants to inflict harm on other sentient beings. So that doesn't necessarily mean physically or verbally harm them, but maybe gossip a little bit to the right person or, you know, just in general wanting to harm someone in, in any way. So I guess in a sense, aggression is just a stronger form of that where you physically or um, verbally want to harm someone, um, it, like directly to in their face. Whereas with uh, harmfulness, it's like you may also do it indirectly, be passive-aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. Ooh. Ooh, shamelessness, that doesn't go well, right? It's still not a good word. Shame, shamelessness. shamelessness oh, that sense. works, right? Shamelessness works. We decided it does work, right? Okay, no shame, having no shame, non-shame. Okay, shamelessness is a mental factor that is a type of ignorance, anger, or attachment which is devoid of a sense of shame with regard to, your neg to our negative reactions. Right, that works? Okay, like we just don't care, never mind. I'll just do whatever I want, kind of. Mm -hmm. Then... In consideration, in consideration is a mental factor that is a type of ignorance, anger, or or that would be like non-integrity, kind of the 
shamelessness, which we don't have to call it that, but it's the opposite of the virtuous action we talked about before, the virtuous mind. In consideration is a mental factor that is a type of ignorance, anger, or attachment, which is devoid of consideration for other sentient beings with regard to our negative actions. Yeah, that makes sense. Don't care. Dullness. Hmm. That's a non-virtual. Depending on if you're really tired, it's not a non-virtual, of course. If you couldn't sleep or whatever. But just like, ugh, can't be bothered, and like, never mind, I'm just not going to get up and get going. So down this is a mental factor that is a type of ignorance which makes the mind lethargic so that it's unable to comprehend its object clearly. And it's, it's important, it's always, and I don't always mention it here, but it's always motivated by one of the afflictive emotions, by one of the afflictions. So out of like, ugh, I'm just so comfortable in my bed, you know, I'm, I don't want to get up, I want this comfort to last. And of course it doesn't last. After a while you get a keep <laughs> But anyway, so it's this kind of like, ugh, I want to engage in something virtuous or whatever. Then excitement. Again, and it's, a neg- it's, it's out of attachment here, it says. It's a mental factor that is a type of attachment which scatters the mind so that it's unable to remain focused on one object. So, of course, you can get excited about things. That it needs to be really, because we, we don't have words for all of those, so you probably have to, we have to probably come up with another word, really. This is an afflicted excitement. It's not excitement in general. You can be excited about something positive. It's not saying you can't experience joy. In fact, I talked about joy being very important. But it's this over-excitement, like getting, like with detachment, um, having also a sense, whatever leads to the excitement, whatever triggers the excitement is permanent. Sense of, it's, it's lasting. Right? There's a moment when there's that excitement and the moment the moment that object, whatever gets you excited, in the next moment it's already changing, it's already going out of existence. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Then, non-faith. Non-faith is a mental factor that is a type of ignorance which, which does not believe in, does not have admiration for, and does not aspire to virtuous phenomena. Okay? Does not believe at all in virtue, does not have any admiration for that or feel joy for that, and does not aspire. So sometimes we're really like frustrated, and like someone does something really good, which ordinarily would would make us happy, or we would rejoice, but we're kind of moody and stuff, and we're like, oh, I can't be, I mean, that's just annoying, or whatever. That would be this type of non-virtue. Mm, laziness. Laziness is a mental factor that is a type of ignorance which, due to attachment to sleep, etc., dislikes or feels sluggish about engaging in non in virtue. So that's a little stronger than just downness, laziness. Non-conscientiousness. Non-conscientiousness is a mental factor that manifests together with one of the three poisons and with laziness, and that leaves the mind in a relaxed state without habituating it to virtue and protecting it from contaminated phenomena. Okay, so it's like especially active. So it's like much more complicated. They don't come on their own. They don't arise on their own. They have other factors that go along with them. Forgetfulness. Um, it's a mental factor that is blurred with respect to virtuous objects owing to remembering non-virtuous objects. So we forget about virtuous objects because we're so busy maybe planning on harming someone or... <laughs> right? right? We, we do that. We, we, we fill our mind with things that are not important, that are actually harmful. Harmful. And as a result of that, we may forget. So it's not forgetfulness that naturally happens. That's not virtuous or non-virtuous. It's just neutral. It's a drag, you know. If it's something important, you forget. But other than that, it's not. Uh, it's not non-virtuous. So we usually say the forgetfulness that is one of those non-virtues. So by implication, then forgetfulness in the sense that it comes from some. What's the word? Some affliction anger, and so forth. <clears throat> the anger we are, when we're really angry, actually it drains our energy. Mm. Right? If you're angry for an hour, you feel exhausted afterwards. Um, so, it can give us some strength. It does give us some strength in the moment, as in like, you know, maybe you fight in that moment, but it totally exhausts you. It doesn't replenish your energy. While love and compassion, they give you energy, but they replenish your your strength, as in like you, you you continuously feel strong, right? It's not like you feel totally exhausted after a day of, of love. 
I mean, the right kind of pasta. <laughs> <laughs> Not the other one that's mixed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, non-alertness or non-introspection is a mental factor. You see, oh, the word alertness, that's what's used sometimes for um, uh, shishin. But like I said, I think it has more of the connotation of looking inwards yeah, for introspection. Non-alertness is a mental factor that is a type of afflicted wisdom which is not alert with respect to physical, verbal, and mental actions. And again, out of one of the... Um, one uh, which out of one of the afflictive emotions or one of the afflictions giving rise to it. Distraction is a mental factor that is a type of anger, attachment or ignorance which is distracted. So again, not distracted for any other reason but out of anger, out of misperception, out of um, attachment. Okay. All right. Those are the ten known virtues. Can you come up with other ones? Guilt. Guilt. Okay, guilt. Well, guilt, um, it's, it's a very negative, yeah, it's a type of anger, actually, mm-hmm. anger with ourselves, because of having done something wrong, or like, it's, a, it's an exaggerated form of regret, mm-hmm. uh, like, recognize, like, regret is just recognizing an action, but it's only focusing on the action itself, not on yourself, mm-hmm. right, it's only like, indirectly I've made a mistake because of an action. But that's it. It's basically focusing on the action and not considering myself to be bad or, you know, horrible, whatever. While um, guilt, it's the same as with anger. You know, if the mind is not angry yet, we look at a negativity, recognize it as such, but see it as part of a, a whole, like a much vaster, wider picture of a person having, of course, good qualities as well. So, like, a, a non-exaggerated version of anger would be to recognize someone made a mistake and seeing that as a negative quality that may harm that person and other people, but also see it as part of a much, much more sophisticated person, as in, like, having other qualities that are positive. So, and then if you then focus just in on that and exaggerate that, see the... Like, you focus in on it, you exaggerating attitude that precedes the anger, kind of blows it up so much that now the person and that negativity become one and, and not dis- indistinguishable, then that gives rise to anger. So guilt is like that, but guilt is a type of anger where you focus on one mistake you made, and instead of recognizing all your good qualities and all the things, all the... the uh, the actions that were not mistakes, that were positive, you focus in on that and you exaggerate that. You exaggerate that to such a degree that you can only look at yourself as the one make, make, who made that mistake. So you and that mistake become indistinguishable and now you, you dislike yourself. Like you feel bad about yourself. Like There's a sense of dislike, but also a sense of... Um, I can feel it in my chest. It's really funny. I, I kind of put it into words. Like, ugh. It's kind of like pulling you down. I'm so horrible. And just feeling really low about yourself. So a dislike and feeling low about yourself. It kind of drains your energy. Um, so that's guilt. So very good. That should actually be one, you know, one of those. But Tibetans don't seem to really experience that. They have a word for guilt. But there is really, I mean, there is a word for it. But it doesn't really mean the same as in English. And no one knows it. Is it an exaggerated form of shame that we talked about earlier? When we talked about shame? Mm-hmm. Out of self-respect, for instance. Or out of, you feel like, integrity. Like, uh-huh. Um, or non-integrity, or non, or shamelessness. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it could be that, but I think it's much more. It's it, like shamelessness would be. I don't care. I've done something negative, and here the opposite. I care. I've done something negative, but then you exaggerate it, yes. right? So you exaggerate that. So the opposite of that, and then exaggerating that. But, so, uh, exaggerated form of integrity, like, you could say that, yes, it's, yes, I guess you could say that, actually, you're right. But the more I think about it, yes. So, it's kind of a type of anger. It works the same way, basically, as our anger towards another person. But then, because it is, so, exaggerating that, 
thinking that yourself and that action are indistinguishable. Also holding on to this action as if now this action is still with me. It still defines me, although it may have been a year ago, right? Like I've done something, okay, I cannot change, of course, what I've done. But since I cannot change it, I feel this is still with me. This action it still defines me, although I would never do this again, but I still feel it's with me. That is involved. And then you feel bad about yourself, low about yourself, maybe even angry, but definitely low about yourself, right? Could it be an exaggerated form of attachment to the self? Oh, yes, it does come as an exaggerated form of attachment, definitely because I cannot fail. I need to be... This is like one of it's just to say like, uh, this is one of my uh, issues with being perfect. It's like watching commercials and watching it like with the attentiveness. What are they suggesting, right? Uh, these subliminal, sub, subliminal, subliminal kind of messages. And I read on this a little bit. I read on this first, right? And that gave me some clue. And then I looked for it. it's great. I just Google subliminal messages in advertising. It's great because they have it all like a whole list of there. And then a lot of it wants to suggest that you become perfect, that you're not satisfied with yourself until you're perfect. And if you buy this and you get that, then you become perfect. So this is the subliminal uh, message. Uh, and that gets you to buy things because they never suggest go and meditate, right? They don't suggest that, work on your own, you know, certain things, right? Yeah. So don't work on your contentment. Exactly. It's like you're not whole because you're not having that car and you're, miss you're not using the right washing powder. It's bizarre. It's bizarre how that influences us. Right? We bring the two together. The desire to have this arises and then you hear Ariel. And the next time you're in the store, the, you see that and it may, I mean, that's how they explain it. it, it <laughs> You see, Ariel, that emotion, I want to be really perfect housewife, whatever, and then you buy that. It should be illegal. <laughs> They're coercing you into buying stupid stuff. <laughs> anyway, so therefore I think this idea of being perfect, this idea of being perfect, a lot of my relatives... They're saying they, they, they do therapy and then they figure out their problem is wanting to be perfect. What a pressure to put on yourself. Not even the Buddha is perfect, right? And then not even the Buddha is perfect. You're putting all that pressure on yourself and you're looking in the wrong direction for perfection. I mean, the, the closest to perfection would, have, would be to have the mind of a Buddha. But you don't find it get buying stuff and, and, I don't know, having a good reputation, etc. It's bizarre. It's, it's so much suffering in this world, so much energy, so much strength, so much, I mean, all the energy, if we had, if all the energy we have invested in just getting pain, sorry, gain, pleasure, reputation and praise, we would be long enlightened. Enlightenment is not that hard. We work much harder, it seems hard, but it's actually much harder to work for our attachment to work for our desire. It's much harder, right? And people think, oh, enlightenment is so difficult. It isn't. It's, it's actually relatively easy in comparison to all the hardship we've gone, to, we've gone through for the sake of the eight worldly dharmas, or at least the four worldly dharmas, right? If you just recognize that, we're much more enthusiastic about just leave aside all that other stuff and just get focused. Um, I'm not really relating to the way you explain Because, okay. um, for um, let's say I've, I've got an experience in 2015 when there was a Nepal earthquake, I was in Kofan. Okay. And it happened on a Saturday morning. Okay. And my flight was on a Tuesday. Okay. Next Tuesday. Okay. And while going, I felt guilty to leave. To leave. Okay. And I was telling that to the mom, and he goes, No, 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 don't feel guilty. But I felt guilty because I was going back at my home where everything was okay. And I was leaving in a state, but, but Nepal was in a state. Really and state. you were leaving everyone behind? Exactly, in a state of distress, and I was leaving. Without doing something about that, exactly. okay. And, and um, mm. the mom was saying, oh, no, 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 it's a, it's a good lesson of impermanence, so don't feel guilty. <laughs> so that's an interesting form of guilt I, I understand survival guilt 
is another form of guilt, right? That's really bizarre when people are the only, like if you, you're the only person surviving a plane crash and you feel guilty for surviving. That is an extreme version of what you described. The more extreme version is the, 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 the guilt of survival. You, yours is not that extreme. But that's a very interesting thought. That's very interesting. Okay, all right, let's look at that. Also, when, um, I mean, it's happened to me. Uh -huh. You're going to work, yes. you're in a car, yes. and you see there's an accident. Yes, happened, yes, and, uh, and you don't stop. stop. But the immediate reaction is like, oh. You need to do something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then the thought is, well, maybe I make it worse, or I don't have the expertise. Yeah. Or maybe other people are already helping that person. Well, or yeah, hopefully. <laughs> No, for whatever awesome. it is, walking away uh -huh. and that, that feeling. Uh -huh. that you yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could mean, have done something. I mean, to me it happens, you know, like there are other people who do go and do it. Why don't I? Why don't Why I? I'm not able to go and do it. Okay, I get that. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Good. It is also, it has got to do with how you perceive yourself, your eye. So if you don't find yourself fit into that thing. You feel, you know, ah. Guilty ah, if you have a certain expectation of yourself, yourself yeah. I should be like this, Some but I cannot be like that. That actually, that is actually a summary of every case here, I think. Mm -hmm. In a way, like, you feel like I should help other people, but opinion. I get away. Okay. I should stop for the accident, but I don't. So, William. It's actually like um, a sin in a way. Old Christianity <coughs> called ascetic, and it's meant to Old be the life unlived. The life unlived. The, life the, unlived. Life unlived. the <laughs> guilt of the life unlived. This is also interesting how in the West we have a very strong, like if you live a Christian, you have a Christian Judo background. I don't know about Judaism, but I know in Christianity, guilt is kind of like yeah. part yeah. of your upbringing, feeling guilty. <laughs> Right? Kind of feeling guilt about what is it, the, 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 the sin we're already born with. What is that called? The original, the original sin. I haven't even done anything. I already carry that original sin. So I'm already guilty. Right? The original, what is the original sin? What is the original sin? You're already born with some... Well, try not to explain it like inherent exists because I don't think that's what they mean. But there's already, you have a fold there. Your imperfection, you're born with imperfection. And that's your original sin. As in like... Yeah, but I don't think they explain it like samsara. I don't think it's like your misperception of reality, right? It's lovely to explain it that way, but I think, I, don't, I never understood it to be that way. When it was the exaggerated version of karma. No, it's not even seen as karma. It's not even exactly. saying you were responsible, you created the causes for that. It's not saying that. It's not talking about a special awareness that is mistaken. I like that interpretation, but without interpreting, the way I was taught was almost like, well, tough luck, you're born imperfect, and that's who you are. Mm -hmm. Kind of like you, you, you have all these faults, and that's, you're stuck in that. So live with it and feel guilty. Except for Jesus, Jesus came into paradise. That's, I mean, it depends. I was, I was raised, come on, in a little village in the middle of nowhere, very Catholic, so, <laughs> and we had to go to, to church. And so. so this is my version of this. This is how I was brought up on it, and so everyone experiences differently, of course. So this is just my personal understanding. It's okay. It's a right of inclusion. It's very right? perfect, but just a little drop of water on your head and you are one of us. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, because Jesus baptism. took it all away. Ah, so with baptism, you... That, no one away, told me that. <laughs> <laughs> they failed to explain that. <laughs> I'm kidding. But I'm just wondering whether there's something because of that kind of religious aspect that may have become part of our culture, right? But then it's interesting... Those of you like from India still experience something very similar in the sense of feeling guilty. Are we your parents? Are we your parents? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Yes. So okay. A sense of I will not feel guilty. It's how you perceive yourself. Some situation happens, and you feel that you shouldn't have done because it's not who you are. Okay. I think that's a very good point that you're making here. I think sometimes we forget causes and conditions. 
such as that although we should do it and we don't do it and we feel bad about ourselves, but to check all the causes and conditions are really there. Will I make it better or will I make it worse? Right? So I'm not saying that in all cases, in all cases that is true. Like, but with the plain right, for instance, yes, I could have changed that, but maybe there's something else I also needed to do. So I need to kind of balance it out. Do I have the money to kind of just cancel the flight and, and stay behind? Am I risking my own life? Am I an ex? What can I do really? How much can I really do something? Can I go into broken buildings, for instance, and get people out? I don't think so. I think that should rather be those who are trained should be doing this. Of course, I can do something, but I can also do something in other areas. So to see the whole picture, see the whole picture. So oftentimes we zoom into one thing, but don't realize, I mean, with these accidents, right? Like in Germany, for instance, you call 911 first thing. And if you have the knowledge, if you've done some course or something, I'd be scared just to move a person who's lying on the ground because with their neck, etc., I never paid attention enough. So I could feel guilty about that and do a course maybe on first aid. I wouldn't even know what to do with their head. So therefore, in that moment, if I haven't done this, I don't know how to help. I could make things worse. I could get them paralyzed because I moved their head in the wrong way. Um, and then if I stop the car and everyone else stops the car, and what's going to happen, Right? So it's not necessarily the best solution. So to call 911, uh, I think that is definitely very important. I remember that years ago, there was a guy who was robbed and he was in the middle of the night. He was und they took away his clothes and he was just naked, running naked at the side of the road. And no one stopped and no one called the police and he died. And that was terrible. That was the extreme, the other extreme. And so later on, the police, they, 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 had, they, they wanted to find who had driven past that person without doing anything. And they just said, well, we need information about who has seen this person. Something happened. So they made it kind of enticing for people to call the police. And those people were later then um, persecuted. And the whole discussion started on this. Because some people said, well, but... If, if he was a, 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 a kidnapper or like whatever, like a person who wanted to rob me, I mean, I would s usually stop. But my thought was I could get robbed. I could get, you know, injured like a naked person, a naked man who's running in the middle of the night. No, on the, right? Like they were scared. Mm -hmm. So that, okay, there's a sense of, okay, it could be dangerous and it could just be, but why not the call the police? Mm -hmm. The first thing you do, you stop somewhere and get help. So that was the problem. So it's like to consider what is better, what is can you make it worse or not, um, and stopping at an accident. I don't. It depends, right? I mean, in, in India, you, I mean, it's a I know it's different. different I know. Mm -hmm. and you have like the people who are the songs and all. I mean, mm -hmm. they just come and run and come and help. Mm -hmm. And it's and then we because no, there's no yeah yeah. Like, mm. yeah. So much better than me. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's actually true. They, yeah, I mean, I feel the same way, you know, they just run right away, they don't care, they get their hands dirty, etc., they're just right there to help, I've heard that. Yeah, so, I mean, to feel guilty again would be extreme, to feel bad about yourself, but rather to think, okay, I've made that mistake, and you see, the problem is we just continue feeling guilty, but don't change. So if you're bad about ourselves, it's almost like I've made up for the situation, I felt guilty. But instead of like feeling I'm so bad, I'm so low, to say, okay, that was wrong, I made a mistake, maybe I should have, da 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 da, but I was, I mean, you were traumatized. Come on, it's honest. I mean, if you were in an earthquake, in that earthquake, you're traumatized. So you cut yourself some slack, is that what you could say that? Yeah. yeah. Cut yourself some slack to the degree like you're not a trained person, like, like a disaster person, etc. So, um, but to sit down and go, all right, now how can I avoid the same situation next time? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? Maybe get some training. How hard can it be? And then to set your mind in the same way as you set your mind to get up at five in the morning, you set your mind next time I'm in a situation like that. First to, to learn about what is the right thing to do. 
I'll do the right thing. Okay? And then you see, next time, because you set your mind to that, you're much more likely to stop. You're self-confident. You know more what you need to do. And that's what you've done. Right? I think that's the same as like when you do the purification practice. Think about what you've done wrong. You generate regret. You generate the wish to not do it again. That doesn't just mean, won't do it again, move on. It means more than that. To think, how can I make a difference next time? How can I react differently? What you, you play it in your mind, how you would go through the situation sensitively. right? Without this whole guilt thing, and without thinking, oh, I've done my part, I felt guilty. No, no, no. It's like you have regret, and you try to amend. Make amends by doing it differently in the future. That makes you feel good, you feel strong, you feel confident, and you're more ready to help. Does that make sense? Yeah. So again, it's kind of like walking that fine line between these extreme emotions. Okay? And then if next time you can't do it, pick yourself up, keep trying. Right? Again, it's just a, a process. Do your best, even the little contribution also. Yeah, do your best. I mean, I personally feel... Let's take them back. Let's take anger. If you get angry right away, and then through a little bit of mental training, next time you find yourself in a similar situation, and you become angry a second later, that's progress. Mm -hmm. That is progress. A second later, two seconds later, and so forth. I just, I just a, co a comment really about about the kind of. The way it's, I think some of this is about about culture and 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 the West versus the non-West. I mean, you know, so much of our lives is, is quite sanitized and quite compartmentalized. That I know huge broad generalizations, and I'm not I'm not suggesting that these are not traumatic events. But but our willingness are, are to, to 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 come out of this sort of nuclear family or this compartmentalized way that we live in, and sort of confront. Difficult, traumatic situations it is 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 a scourge, really, that, that we face because our lives are so unconnected. You know, so it feels it feels traumatic to because we don't see it. Yes. We're so yes. we're so we, it's yes. we, just we live in a bubble. Through. You're so right. You're so right. You are very right about this. Our modern life it keeps us comfy. It keeps us free from certain things, but it keeps us also unable to cope with life. Right? With life. I mean, I noticed one thing in Germany, and in Germany this I think is extreme, how people paint their houses to such a degree you don't see cracks. It's bizarre. It's like this obsession with getting it all whitewashed from the outside. And I was there in Germany for a while, and there was this obsession with like perfection, just the, at the outside. And then I go to France, for instance, and I'm like, oh, some cracks. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, people, why are we so obsessed about things like whitewashing everything? And I'm not saying everyone, but that's the neighborhood where I'm from, and my parents are definitely part of that, and I'm part of the whitewashing generation. And it's like, I was like whitewashing everything, right? And making it perfect and wishing for a perfection where it can't be found. And then not being able to, to deal with, with a crack, which is just natural. Now, I'm exaggerating here. Can you get the shock of coming to India? You know, Calcutta was where I arrived. Whoa. <laughs> no whitewashing. But that is, that, is, that is reality. This is what life is like. And so I think it's so important that we get out of this bubble in the West. This is why it's such a problem that parents pamper their children. They don't want to expose them to anything. And I'm not, telling, I'm not saying parents should have their children watch violent movies. I'm not talking about that. But maybe take them to the poorer parts of cities, maybe in, in terms of charity work, maybe you know, with working with homeless people. Or something. Like expect, expose them to this. This is life. This is suffering, and they are so much more resilient at that age. They can learn much better to find their own resilience at that age. So to to live in this bubble, that's our problem in the West. This, this, this artificial life where you don't even know any longer where milk comes from. Right? You ask a child, where do the carrots come from? From the supermarket. <laughs> I mean, no, not more in touch with... The, with how life is really like. This is why India was for me personally a shock, but a good experience because it's still down to earth. You, you still have the dirt on the carrots. You can infer it doesn't come from a supermarket. 
I mean, I'm exaggerating here a little bit, but he makes a good point. We just need to get out of that artificial bubble and stop whitewashing, right? Anyway, sorry, that was a little bit off. But in the context of, in the context of other non-virtues, guilt is a good one. To what? The other one? Low self esteem. I just wanted to say that. Which one? Low self esteem. Ah, good one. Low self esteem. I love it. Yes, very good. Another one we should add. Low self esteem is another exaggerated version of focusing just on a negative aspect, of just a failure or just a quality that you don't have, or or focusing on a negative quality. Too well. Does that. Ring true? That's what I was thinking. I was thinking it's like the opposite of arrogance. Yeah. The opposite of arrogance. Great. Well explained. The opposite of arrogance. So with arrogance, you, you, you zoom in and exaggerate a positive quality. With uh, low self-esteem, you zoom in and exaggerate a negative quality. Now that's easily said, hard to do, but all you need to do is sit down and make a list of your good qualities. If you can't keep focused enough, make a list of it. And that always reminds me of this story of this teacher. And I say it quickly because you mostly have heard of her. Of this teacher who in school once get her, had her, her pupils. They were very unruly, so she didn't get them to, to listen to her. So she said, you have to now make a list and write something positive about everyone in class. Each person, you have to write something positive about them. And after they had done that, she collected those and made a list for each person You know, there were 20 people in class. There were 20 things that someone had written about them in, in these words of those people. And she gave them to these people. And that meant their life to them. And they talked about how one of them was killed during the Iraq war. And the only thing they found on his body was the list. And another couple, they had gotten married. They were a couple from that class. And their marriage vows were based on that list. So it gave them so much, that list. Because they saw how other people saw them, and it didn't, the low self-esteem and all that, it went away. If you're a teacher, maybe it's something you want to try. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful, right? Because oftentimes we're so, we're, it's out of, again, a wish to be perfect, and then we focus in on our imperfections to change them, but forget our good sides. It comes out of the self judging I want to be this great person, so I only focus on my faults. But the disadvantage is that you forget to focus on your good qualities and you feel low about yourself, low self-esteem. That should be a crime. <laughs> that should be crime. That is just not okay because people suffer so greatly in the West, so unnecessarily, and it's not something we're born with because Tibetans don't have it. They don't have it. They don't have it to the same degree. And as parents, it's also very important to not point out the, the faults of our children too often, but to also every now and then also kind of express their good qualities. Because if you want to, for your child to be good in school, to not just focus on, oh, math, you're really not good at math, etc., but to say, oh, you're good at sports, you're good at arts, right? You're good at making a cake, even though you don't get grades for that, right? So to also foster that in your child, this whole thing about the, the modern education, unfortunately, it's changing now. But when a child was considered to be stupid, when they couldn't do well in certain um, subjects. I mean, they're good at other subjects, and you need to wait sometimes until that comes through. So there are some great schools where they actually find a child's special talents and foster those and enhance those. And through the self-confidence these children have, then they can get them to also learn other things because then they have the self-confidence to do so. So basically, it always comes down to our one-sidedness, black and white. Again and again, it's black and white. A child is stupid, if it doesn't do that, and so forth. So a vaster perception is so important, it comes down to that. So low self-esteem is another one. That should be a non-virtue. Very good. Other ones? There's something to try out something there. Okay, last thing, yes. And we're almost when finished. When praising children, there's some, yes. you can, there's something called like fixed mindsets and growth mindsets. Okay. And if you just say you're good at this, they get this idea that their intelligence is fixed and it's like mm. to praise them for working hard is actually much more effective than ah, nothing. Because nice. if you just like dig them up and go, you're great at that, you're great at that, ah. eventually they will come across some stride and then oh. they will, they're actually not as resilient. Okay, very good. Yeah. Ah, so you're saying it's better to praise them for the effort they've made. Yeah. Very nice. That's very good. Okay, great. That's very important. 
<clears throat> so to praise people more for their hard work, and it doesn't, the result is less important. Yeah. Okay, great. That's good. Yes? Someone yes. asked me a question. Why are there so many more negative afflictions, afflictive things than positive my mental factors? Why are there so many more <laughs> negative ones? It seems to suggest that we're really focusing on the negative more. <laughs> and the Four Noble Truths, they start with suffering, right? <laughs> yes. All right. Um, well, the, it, it seems to really suggest that. And again, like I'm talking more of a, an exaggerated version of not being able to look at our good qualities. Versus here, of course, we, we also sometimes don't like to see suffering, for instance. We try to whitewash it. So we're so good at kind of like... Um, um, like we're, we're not, we actually don't look at negative emotions as much as failure, right? It's, it's much less about my anger is a problem, but rather like I'm not good at anything. It, it's, it's less at the, the state of mind. It's more like not being able to do something, right? So this is different, like actually recognizing that I have this incredible mind, this pure mind that is in the nature of love, compassion, etc., that I have that ability. So a part of Buddhist study is recognizing that and recognizing that there are these temporary, temporary negative emotions that I can change because if I recognize how they work and I recognize their antidote, I can just apply the antidote. So it's, it's not about feeling like a failure, feeling like I can't do this, I can't do that, which seems to be permanent, like the way you expressed it. It's almost like you're, you're caught in that and there's nothing you can do about it. And your past failure is a past failure because you can't turn time back. You can't go back and redo it. So instead of suggesting that past is past, today is a new day, those are the reasons for why we can't do certain things. Let's make changes. And we are the only ones who can make those changes. And of course, there are negative aspects here. We need to more focus on those just because they are, they are much easier to generate. They pop up easily. They pop up all the time. The positive ones don't pop up easily because of our misperception of reality. And so therefore, to be careful as they arise to not turn them into a habit. So therefore, I don't think it's, it's contradicting what I said before, focusing on the negative it's a different way in which you focus on the negative, but you understand its impermanence. You understand that it can be removed relatively easily through recognizing these, these causes. Does that make sense? Does that explain that? Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. Shall we go on and you wait a little bit? Yeah? Can I wait a little? All right. Now, the last four, and then we have time anyway. Uh, well, there's still something else, but we've got some time for questions. So the four changeable mental factors... Those are four mentioned that are changeable because in the sense that they're totally dependent on what goes first or what their object is, for instance. So this is, uh, those are so neutral in and of themselves in the sense that, uh, yeah, it really, they just totally depend on other factors. You could say that about other things too, but it's more pronounced in this case. So the non, the ascertaining, the ascertaining mental factors, and also the five omnipresent ones. Of course, they're also neutral in and of themselves, but here it's just more pronounced, and so it's pointed out. So there are sleep, regret, general investigation, and detailed analysis. All right. So they're changeable because they can be virtuous, non-virtuous, or neutral. All right. That's also true for the other ones, but specifically sleep. Sleep is considered to be a function of the mind, basically, right? So we say it's a function of the mind, it's a mental factor that is the result of mental heaviness or mental dullness and functions to dissolve the sense consciousnesses into the settler mind. Okay, that's fine. So when is that virtuous? It's virtuous if just before you fall asleep, you have really virtuous thoughts. You think, uh, may I be rested the next day to be of great benefit to others? Or just have any positive thought. And it's interesting because your, your, your dreams can be strongly influenced by that. Have you ever noticed when you have a really negative mind before you fall asleep, like a really negative ones, and you dream about whatever it was the whole night? You can hardly sleep, right? You don't sleep well. So actually the last, the state of mind, uh, our, our state of mind just before going to sleep influences the quality of the mind that is the sleeping mind. And 
if we can change that, it's considered to be so important to generate a positive state of mind before you fall asleep. Just let go of all the, the stuff that happened throughout the day. That's why you do purification in the evening. That helps you to let go. In the evening, right, whatever mistakes we've made, we purify them, we let them go with the determination to make it differently, but a strength of mind, a kind of courage, okay? And then, then, then you go to bed, you kind of free your mind, you think of the welfare of all sentient beings, may I be well rested for the welfare of all sentient beings, may I be able to dedicate my day tomorrow towards others' happiness, and then you sleep really well. It's, it's a good time of sleeping well, instead of taking a sleeping pill. But you need to get yourself, we can't often let go, that's our problem. So to learn to let go, Whatever has, got, has happened has happened. Right now, I cannot, cannot deal with it. In fact, I have to sleep. Generate a virtuous mind. And your sleep becomes a virtue. Like, I don't know, whatever, however long you sleep, six, seven, eight hours a night. Wow, those are well spent. You Actually, your entire night is virtuous. Okay? So just before you fall asleep, make, a, make it a point. Think of think positive thoughts, such as wishing to benefit others, for instance. Right? And... I just had this thought about compassion because I met, I meant, I mentioned the word courage. Also, compassion. It's not about feeling low about the suffering of others. Compassion is courage. Is the wish to recognize other people are suffering and the courage. I will do something. Determination. I will give my best to do something against it. Right. So if you can generate a compassion. My situation is not as bad as a lot of other people's situation. So that takes you out of kind of self-pity, I mean, that's like a nasty word, but, you know, like um, dwelling on our problems, to think of other people's problems, how much worse they are, right? Um, just talk to a group of people, you find your problems, everyone else has them, and sometimes they're even worse. And on top of that, then generate the determination. I have a, I have a lot of opportunities, I have a lot of abilities, I have a lot of freedoms, I will use those for the benefit of other sentient beings. And you fall asleep like that, you sleep much better than the other way around. So I think that's why it's important to mention sleep. And of course, death, you should die with this attitude too. You're going to die one day. So if you train yourself to do this before you, own, before you go to sleep, you're more likely to do this when you die. Because the process is very similar, right? You don't have the same, yeah, the dissolutions of the mind, but also this heaviness of the mind, the, the, the kind of lack of energy, not being able to move, etc. Of course, doing death is much more pronounced. But to really use our sleep, we can s relatively easily transform seven, eight, whatever hours every night through this. So make it a point. A minute before you fall asleep, just you know, try to prepare. And you're actually also preparing for your own death in that sense. As I said, you create a habit. And then when you're actually about to, to die, of course, a sudden death is harder to do that, but most people don't die a sudden death. I don't think they do. Most people die, you know, slowly. And so you can do that, and you're well prepared for your own death. Okay, so sleep. The next one is regret. Okay, regret that feels remorse for physical, verbal, or mental actions done in the past. Why is this so important? In terms of understanding, it's positive or negative. Positive, negative one is fine. If I did something that was wrong and I have regret, not guilt, not exaggerated, just a recognition this was wrong, okay, this was not okay, first to recognize that and to generate the wish to not do it again. That's very healthy regret. Okay. It's somehow, I think, healthy regret includes the wish to not do it again. Right? Because if it's like, I'll do it again. I was wrong, but I'll do it again. That's not real regret. So it kind of includes, at least it induces the sense, I shouldn't do it again. That was wrong. Okay, I don't want to do this again. But why is it so important to, to, to recognize that there's a non-virtuous type? The, the best example, I think, is when you practice generosity and you give too much. Now the money's gone. If then you regret Having given it, the virtue is gone. Money's gone, virtue is gone. Great. So if you've given back too much, if you've given away too much, don't regret it. 
You can't get it back. Well, if you can, okay, then go and get it, <laughs> right? <laughs> but usually you cannot. Let it go. Because if you then regret having given that much, in the same way as previously with the negative action, you actually already take away from the non-virtue. Here, if you regret the virtue, you, you reduce the virtue or possibly get rid of the virtue. So if you've given too much, at least don't regret it. Rejoice. Okay? To solidify. So you've just lost the money. You haven't lost the virtue. Can you, like, correct your mind on that? (laughs) Yes, you can. You can. You can correct on it. You go, okay, I regretted that. I regret that I regretted it. Um, (laughs) It was great. Let it go. Another thing that is really a kind action, which is really difficult. Very difficult. When someone steals from you, give it to them. If you cannot give it back, that is the kindest action. Okay, someone has, because someone has still stolen something from you, like no way you can get it back. Okay, so a pickpocket, I don't know, somewhere in the big city, they've taken off with your purse, they've taken off with your mobile phone, no way you can get it back. Give it to them. If you give it to them, the non-virtue of stealing, it won't be so bad for them. Of course, you still alarm the police. They should be punished for it. They should still be disciplined for it if you can. But if you cannot discipline them for that, I mean, give it to them. Practice generosity, right? I mean, they're probably in a habit of stealing, etc. Um, they will experience, of course, some negativity, but it also benefits them. That is a beautiful way of benefiting them. You let go. You let go of your resentment because oftentimes you carry this resentment. How dare they? How dare they took my... You can't let it go. Again and again, you're thinking like, if I just had, if I just had turned around and I could have grabbed them and where you go through, let it go. Give it to them. Give it to them. It's really good for your um, resentment, like getting go of that resentment mainly. But in a way, you're also kind of benefiting them. Okay? All right. No, no questions. No. I'll say, okay, okay. (laughs) Don't want to be that harsh, but um, I just can we wait a little bit because we have we don't have a break. I just want to finish this, and Nikita, I promise you can ask that. Well, there's no question. I just wanted to add that. The <laughs> oh, you wanted to add something? I thought you said you asked something. The karmic implication of that generosity of wanting to give and then regretting it mm-hmm. is that in this lifetime or in the future lifetime, you will have a lot of abundance in the form of property, like you say, but it will be in litigation, like in court cases. Mm-hmm. Who said that? <laughs> uh, one of the monks, because that's what's happening in my family a lot. Okay. So I asked why, and okay. they said it's because you you always want to give something, but then you like you kind of have like this regret towards it. Ah, so that's interesting. One of the, that's one of the co- results of that. Okay, I haven't heard of that, but it kind of makes sense. Yes. Okay, interesting. So another good reason not to have regret, right? Because yeah, yeah, you you've given something, but still. It'll never really be enjoyable what you've given. Okay, and whatever, whoever raised their hands, can we do it a little bit, right? Just, just finish this, mm-hmm. then we have it out of the way, and then we have time in the afternoon and tomorrow to deliver the rest, the rest of the uh, handout. Okay, great. So regret, we've got regret. General investigation. Investigation is a mental factor that roughly examines the general nature of an object. And then detailed analysis is a mental factor that thoroughly examines the detailed nature of an object. And of course, it's again dependent on what is the object. If it's robbing a bank, robbing a, ba- robbing a bank. So you, in, analysis and investigation is very important, but I've already talked about this. We use analysis and investigation all the time, even for anger, etc. We get angry, we get angrier and angrier if we just think about... I mean, we've all had that experience, right? Some, someone did something wrong, and then we think about all the details, we come to the conclusion, they did this purposely, they did this to harm us, they did this... Brrr, and then our anger grows, you know, in all directions, basically. So in that case, that kind of analysis, which may be very good and thorough, still, it's, it's considered to be negative. While on the other hand, if we think about the benefits of love, compassion... That kind of analysis is a positive one. It's analytical meditation. It becomes like an analytical meditation, such that if it's most... In, we, we're doing analytical meditation all the time. Actually, like when people have a problem with analytical meditation, well, look at your own life. 
And you see, analytical meditation that leads to a change in emotions, like no, analysis that leads to a change in emotions, that is deep analytical meditation. Well, the one that leads to our anger, that is real deep analytical meditation. It's not just superficial, because a superficial type of analysis doesn't give rise to anger. If it's really deep, it gives rise, like a negative type. If it's really deep, it gives rise to anger, jealousy, and so forth. So that's why we try to counteract that with analytical <coughs> meditation that is not just thinking about it in a superficial way because that won't give rise to emotions. But rather it's a, a very deep kind of analysis which again triggers emotions, but positive ones this time. The sense that if I react with anger, it just won't help the situation. I can't, it, it just doesn't help. So in that way you train yourself Right? If you meditate on, on anger, as in like the negative type, you meditate really on anger, not only do you get angry now, you're more likely when the circumstances, similar circumstances arise, to be angry because you've come to the conclusion it makes sense to get angry. So you get again, again and you get angry when those circumstances arise. Now, in the opposite way, if you understand, but it doesn't help, it makes me feel miserable, it makes me do things that I regret. It triggers negative emotions in the other person, and then we're caught in this never-ending fight, which ends in divorce, for instance, as an example. So then, to now think about the disadvantages of anger, the, dis the good qualities of the other person, what they have tried, how I didn't understand, try to see the full picture, then next time, when those circumstances arise, you don't get angry. Instead, five seconds, you stay calm. Five more seconds calmer than usual. And the momentum, what, is the, what do you call that? The momentum is past. Mm -hmm. So then the momentum where you could actually get angry, you cannot. Mm -hmm. And you very calmly can explain, look, I know where you're coming from. I get that. But I also feel kind of misunderstood in that moment. Right? The moment you say that, the other person is able to say, all right, you understand where I'm coming from. Now... You're giving me the opportunity to understand where you're coming from. Usually, it triggers something in other people. Usually, it does. Have you ever been in a situation where you've made something wrong and someone comes towards you and it's like, you idiot! And you go, oh, I'm so sorry. You're right. You're totally right. And right away, anger's gone. How can they be angry? Right? If you say, if you're not defensive, you go, yeah, all right. <laughs> you actually, you've got a point there. I made a, I'm so sorry. If you really express that, they kind of go, oh, oh it wasn't so bad, never mind. <laughs> right? It's amazing. So it's amazing how we can avoid this whole conflict because we take a moment and go, yeah, you're right. You really show that, oh my God, I wasn't thinking. It was wrong. Really, seriously. And you're not pretending. So this is through this type of analysis. That's why analytical meditation is so important. Just doing concentration meditation, that's not enough. Because you, you, if you can stop through concentration meditation, your analysis that leads to anger, fine. But it doesn't stop that. It doesn't stop that. Usually it doesn't. So since it doesn't stop, this is your counterforce. And you need to sometimes do it more often and sometimes less often. Sometimes you focus more on single-pointedness, on observation, etc. That's wonderful and important. But balance here... Balance here is very important. So oftentimes people, they hate analytical meditation. I get that, because it's hard to force yourself to analyze something that usually comes natural. Right? We don't need to make an effort to analyze the mind that when someone says something to you you find disturbing, it, it, you don't even have to think. You don't have to make an effort. You have to make an effort to stop it. <laughs> Instead of, you know, it just does the same thing. So that's why this type of analytical meditation initially requires so much effort. But you get better at it. There's nothing that doesn't become easy. And at some point, the Dharma becomes part of your life. This is taking refuge. Taking refuge is really like when, instead of allowing your deflective emotions to, to tell the story, to analyze, to examine, the Dharma takes over. Right? That is real taking refuge. You're really integrating it into your life. When a problem arises, how can I deal with it? Okay, someone abused me. Someone said something terrible. Where does the Dharma deal with this? What did I learn about it? And instead of allowing your mind to go crazy on what they've done to you, 
you sit down with this and think, okay, this is the result of my karma. This person is giving me the opportunity to practice patience. An obnoxious person. Thank you. Wonderful. How else would I practice patience? Right? This is the opportunity to get to know my own anger. I know it's difficult. It seems impossible. But trust me, over time it gets easier. Everyone can, who's done this for a few years can tell you it gets easier if you just hang in there. Just don't give up, as the Sonia says. Don't become a Buddhist. Who cares? Be a better Jew, a better Christian, a better Muslim, a better Hindu, whatever. Huh? Or atheist. Be a good atheist or agnostic. But this is working. This works. This is just basic psychology. Right? Based on how we are right now. Basic psychology. Okay. Anyway. Therefore, investigation, analysis, if it is done with a sense of reality, when you bring in reality, it's positive. When you exaggerate, it's negative. That's it. Very easy. In accordance with reality, it's positive. Not in accordance with reality. Exaggerating certain aspects negative simple as that okay positive means of course yeah leading to positive state it can also be neutral if you just analyze how what a tea leaf is made of how virtue can that be unless you want to make tea for others to benefit them okay great now the last few pages on course and subtle mind got it Oh, the detail analysis? So the general is just in general, to get the whole picture, and then more detailed kind of analysis of that is going into more detail. So, yeah, I don't know why they distinguish between the two, because it's a type of analysis in both cases, but th th there is this kind of like just getting a general sense of what something means and going into more detail, so I guess it's important to mention those two. Okay, great. Coarse and subtle minds. Okay. Does anyone feel like they have to go to the bathroom? Oh, can you do a speed pee? Speed pee. <laughs> <laughs>
Our gross awarenesses or coarse awarenesses rely heavily on our physical body, especially on the brain. Okay, so that's really where the brain, of course, is very important. Uh, any alteration or even damage to the brain, for instance, when suffering from a stroke or brain injuries, has an inevitable effect on the coarse mind. Makes sense. Via the sense consciousnesses, usually, they say, through the sense consciousnesses, then the mental consciousness is also affected. Um, conversely, any change and transformation of the mind also affects the brain and possibly the entire body. So it goes both ways, they affect each other. The majority of our afflictions, such as ignorance, anger, etc., are gross awarenesses. So another reason why in Tantra you try to access subtler minds and control them. Oh, I just remember you said you mentioned something. Oh, I'll mention it later, what you mentioned in, in the break. Okay. Anyway, the second category of subtle minds refers to the awarenesses that become active while we're asleep, fainting, during the initial stages of death, and for advanced practitioners on the completion stage of highest yoga tantra. That is like high up there. So tantra has four classes, kriya, charya, yoga, and anuttara yoga. And anuttara yoga is the highest. And that can be divided into the generation part, generation stage, and completion stage. Completion stage is the highest. So it's really the highest of the highest levels of tantra when you really... Uh, access subtler levels of mind. All the other levels are more preparations towards that. Um, during the initial and for advanced practitioner, on the case. these minds depend less on the physical body and their objects are more subtle. Examples are dream consciousnesses. So your dreams can be very vivid and the mind, the brain, doesn't have to be that active. Doesn't I don't know. This needs to be seen. Is there the same brain activity like while you're awake versus when you're asleep, for instance, or when you're dreaming, right? It could be, of course, very pronounced, but I, I'm not sure it always is. And anyway, the other parts of your body, they're resting. There's no other part involved. Your sense uh, powers, they're not at all active. While, while you're awake, they have to all be active. Okay? And the, 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 your body is in movement. There's probably more warmth in the body while you're awake. So there's still a lot more activity while we're awake. The third category of the subtlest consciousness refers to what is called the clear light mind. Clear light mind. Um, why? Because, I didn't mention this, but there's this appearance of just clarity. Okay. So when people say that in other cultures, they talk about walking into the white light. Okay, so I guess that's just because people perceive this. Also in other cultures, they perceive a very bright light. It's of course not an external light, but there's a perception of like when this mind arises, you basically kind of absorb yourself into that. So that is kind of like walking into the bright light. Before that, you can have visions of all sorts of things, right? And they're not necessarily realistic. You can see certain things, etc., also afterwards, of course, but there's definitely this perception of the white, of that white light. And I mentioned earlier that I saw a documentary about from the BBC on the human body, with each uh, episodes episode describing one level of development, and the last one was death. And uh, there was uh, a description like one person was interviewed who had a near death experience, and he talked about that white light. And it was really beautiful the way he described it. He said, that white light was in the nature of wisdom and love. I, I, there was nothing Buddhist about him. Or everything else he said was not. But he said it was just love and it was knowledge or it was wisdom. He, that's how he put it. And he said it was so comforting. It was, it was like, I, I don't know, I don't remember his own words. But it was really like, he's like, I'm not afraid of dying. I, I can't wait to have that experience again. So he was very fortunate to have had that experience because he was saying I'm not what 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 expect what, what I'm expecting or what I'm I'm awaiting is so wonderful so I'm not worried about this but this is the white light the way he describes it is exactly how it's described here it's like in the nature of love love and wisdom it's this white light blissful happy peaceful etc but the problem is we cannot hold it because of our gross minds they take over so in tantric practice, you're actually accessing that mind, and you get rid of the other minds. That's 
the practice really, accessing that. But that is so super difficult. And you still need to purify the other minds. You can't just try to hold on to it. You can't. You just can't. You still need to purify. So all these activities that you go through in that you learn is part of the process of reducing these coarser minds and preparing you for that. Eventually, you, through these practices, you access just that subtle mind. So that is, from a tantric point of view, that which becomes a Buddha. That's that mind. You'll be able to fully develop in the sense of like fully access and control. And this is the mind of a Buddha, basically. So we have, when we say we have Buddha nature, from a tantric point of view, well, we have that subtle, clear light mind that manifests at the time of death. A similitude of that manifests while we fall asleep, when we are fainting, right? When we sneeze and during orgasm, orgasm, I need to say. But again, it's just, it's a similitude only. It's quite interesting when this French, what is what is a sneeze? What is the French word for sneezing? Small death, right? I mean, that's orgasm. Oh, that's orgasm. Small death. Oh. <laughs> Small death. That's so interesting, right? They say like these, they're doing certain situations. So fainting, uh, sleeping, orgasm, orgasm uh, sneezing. All these states, there's a similar to that's similar to the clear light mind. Like it's slightly subtler mind for a short moment, and so it's very funny that we say, uh, yeah, short, like a short death, as in like someone must have recognized that a similar mind arises during that time, and therefore calling it that, right? Because during death, you really have the clear light mind. Okay, all right. Um, what else? Yes, so this is the awareness that is in the case of an ordinary living being who becomes acti- active only at the time of death. So the real pure light mind or the clear light mind only rises at the moment of death. without depending, uh, And it exists without depending on the physical body. Advanced practitioners on the completion stage of highest yoga tantra can manifest the subtle clear light mind also through meditation. So, but if to do this, so people... Oftentimes, this is the problem teaching this in the West because people want this and they just want to do it and they do these practices. And then I know of a German guy who was here for many years who practiced this and his teacher told him not to do it. And he didn't listen to what his teacher said and he really went crazy. He literally lost his mind. He stopped sleeping. He stopped stopped eating. He, he did these practices with the subtle energy and he couldn't control it. And uh, he had to be brought home, and he's still not okay. I've seen him recently, he's still not okay. Still not alright. And he lived with his parents for the next 20 years. This is potentially so dangerous, he couldn't live on his own. And he was here, he just, he never smiles, he looks totally drained. You know why Buddhism is called Lamaism? It's not, it's not, Lamaism is not the right word to describe Buddhism, but use, it was called that in, in, in some like 50, 60 years ago when Buddhism became more popular, there was a lot of emphasis on a teacher. But only when you do this time of, of Tantra. It's, it's like you take little steps and someone needs to guide you because you can go off the wagon really easily. It's so dangerous. It's so dangerous to do this practice if you're not ready. So your teacher is with you at all, at all times in the sense like giving you instructions again and again. And you need to listen to. So this is where you need a teacher where you exactly listen to what the teacher tells you. And you make that commitment to that person. But that you don't have to do if you don't practice Tantra. You don't have to make that kind of commitment to, to, sit, to listen to exactly and see your teacher as pure, etc. You only need to do that when you practice Tantra. As long as the Dalai Lama has emphasized that. So if you've taken high yoga tantric initiation from someone, you make that commitment. If you haven't, you don't need to do that. Whoops. When you do that, when you when you have taken high yoga tantric initiation, even if you're not ready, you still want to practice that because otherwise some people take initiations and they're not ready and just taking an initiation is not as dangerous as practicing it. But then you should really follow that. You should, the Lama who've given you the initiation, you should see them as pure because otherwise you break the Samaya. You've taken a vow, even if you're not ready, but tough luck. You've done it without being ready. Now live with the consequences. But you really try to. That's really important because otherwise you, you stop, you're, 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 you're holding yourself away from like having that, ability, that possibility again. But better to wait. 
No need to take the highest yoga tantric initiation. Taking as a blessing, you can even do that. Take it as a blessing. Don't do the whole thing. So, but once you've made that commitment, and if you're a highest yoga tantric practitioner, you need those instructions. You're, you're, what is the, what is the word? Like you're on the tight rope. You know, you could fall this side, you could fall that side. It is the tight road that takes you to enlightenment in the most speediest way. You don't have to go through the valley and, you know, up and down and all these curves, which takes much longer, but it's not dangerous, versus kind of going from one hill to the other via a tight rope, a tight rope and someone is leading you. And if you don't, and you're blind. The person leading you is your teacher. And you take, if you don't trust them, you take the wrong step, and you fall down, Right? If you don't listen to what they tell you, you fall down. So that's the, the, in, the importance of a teacher or guru. And that has been abused. That has been abused. Of course, wherever there's something very powerful, it can be abused. So you have to check your teacher well. Don't just take someone who claims to be a teacher. And if you really... So this whole kind of misunderstanding, a lot of aspects of Buddhism, is not understanding this belongs to highest yoga tantric practice. This is actually secret. And the reason why it's secret is that it can be, you can be, you can so easily fall off that rope. And only very few people in this world are ready to really practice this. If His Holiness the Dalai Lama gives an initiation, for instance, to like a thousand people, you, you can't stop people. Like, it's not like you cannot, you cannot tell them you're not allowed to come. You can just say, well, this is for this type, this type of person. So those those people who don't know anything about tantra, they don't get the initiation anyway. So they don't need to worry, even if they're present. They just get it as a blessing. But those who do know, they know of the consequences. And then if they still remain and they take the initiation, it comes with a commitment. A commitment, not just prayers that you have to do every day. That's one commitment. But commitment towards the teacher, seeing them as a Buddha, following them. Even if they're not a Buddha. Because that's part of the whole deal. I mean, actually, the person who gives a high or a tantric initiation... They're usually qualified and they're able to, t to guide you in such a way. And guide you doesn't mean you have to be in their presence. There's other ways in which someone can guide you. These high lamas communicate in different ways. And if his homeless gives an initiation to a thousand people, there may be three who actually fully receive the initiation, who are fully ready to receive it. But if you still take it and you know what you're doing, you still have to keep the Samaya. So... I keep just saying that about because it's been, oh my God, how many people want to just skip all the rest and go right into Tantra. And then they, they, they take initiations from a teacher who's either not qualified or they take initiations. He's fully qualified or she's fully qualified. Then the person does something. They cannot hold their Samaya because they're not all Buddhas. Not every guru is a Buddha. This is so bizarre. In the West, we think like either person is ordinary or a Buddha. So a Lama, just even if you're supposed to see them as Buddhas, doesn't make them Buddhas, right? So you, you try to see them as Buddhas, but on the other hand, so in that way, to have a perception of a Buddha, but when they make mistakes, you have to deal with it, okay? When they make mistakes, which they can do, if they're not Buddhas, it may happen. But then you need to focus on just the aspect of their guru mind. Okay? And that is so difficult. With black and white, most people can't do it. Either the person is a hero or is a devil. That's it. So it's happening right now. Devil or... Right? Even with high lamas who are really fully qualified, things can happen. And we cannot find the balance. This is why this is so difficult. This is why I think we shouldn't practice highest yoga tantra unless we're fully ready. Just take it as a blessing. Sorry, I'm probably talking to people who are like, what is she talking about? <laughs> but if those of you who understand a little bit of what I'm saying, you may see the danger of that. Mm -hmm. So here you have a system that offers an incredibly powerful technique. But any powerful thing, such as nuclear energy, is potentially very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So tantra is the nuclear energy of Buddhism. Right? So be very careful. Okay. Having said that, just having said that, the, that's where the guru comes in, where Lamaism and all that comes in. It doesn't come in in, in the other. You don't need to see your teacher as a, as a Buddha. You can do that. Even if, a, even if you have a Lama, it should be a qualified Lama, like someone who's considered to be a Lama. And then even if this person is only a Bodhisattva and not a Buddha, 
If you see them as a Buddha, you get the full benefit of relay, relying on a Buddha. But then you have the difficulties when they do something that either it was a mistake, they've made a mistake because they're not Buddha as yet, or it's a projection of your mind. If you cannot deal with it, you have a problem. So, pardon? No. I mean, you know, I do the usual stuff, but I'm not a, I don't practice Tantra. All right. Now, this is the awareness, the clear light mind, that is in the case, and anyway, you can't ask people that. <laughs> I know it was totally innocent, but usually you shouldn't ask because it's supposed to be a secret. So we don't ask each other, did you get this initiation or that initiation? Yeah. We don't ask each other because it was supposed to be secret, but you didn't know. I know it was totally innocent, so don't, no need to be better. Okay, this is the awareness that in the case of ordinary living beings becomes active only at the time of death, okay, and uh, exists without depending on the physical body, only on the subtle wind or subtle energy. It only depends on that. Advanced practitioners on the completion stage of highest yoga tantra can manifest the subtle clear light mind also through meditation. The third, uh, according to tantric scriptures, all awarenesses are mounted on energy, on energy winds, to put it, to, to add the Tibetan word wind in here, so really subtle energies or energy winds, which in turn flow through the energy channels in our body. We have about 72,000 different energy channels that, similar to our blood vessels, are spread out over our entire body. But they're not visible to us, they're, they're very subtle. Furthermore, there are three main channels, the right the right, left, and central channel. The central channel begins at the point between the eyebrows and descends in an arc towards the top of your head. From there, it descends in a straight line down, down past your throat and so forth, your heart, or the center of your chest, down to the, past the navel, and then the end of the spine, and then under the trunk of the body to the opening or tip of the sexual organ. Immediately to either side of the central channel are the right and left channels. At various places, the right and left channels wrap around the central channel, constricting the flow of the energy winds. They are explained to be seven places of constriction called channel wheel or chakra. Chakra. We had that word before, right? They are located at the forehead, the crown of the head, the throat, the heart, or better, at the center of the chest, the navel, at the base of the spine, and the opening or tip of the sexual organ. All right. The very subtle mind and its mounted energy wind are located within a tiny vacuole, vacuole? Vacuole. vacuole inside the central channel at the center of the heart chakra. This mind is also called, so the clear light mind, this mind is also called the root mind because all the other minds arise from it and dissolve or transform back into it. Another name for the subtlest mind is the continually abiding mind. It's another word for it. So clear light mind or continually abiding mind. Because it is the only mind that continues from one life to the next. The subtle clear light mind is non-conceptual and free from any kind of affliction. As ordinary living beings, we're not able to utilize or influence the subtle the subtle and very subtle awarenesses. So not even the very subtle, not, not even the subtle ones we can really influence. This is why we say that while we're sleeping, fainting, etc., that we are unconscious. For even though there's always a mental consciousness that is aware or conscious, we are unable to utilize it, and upon waking up, are mostly unable to recollect what the consciousnesses, what the consciousnesses have apprehended, what that consciousness apprehended. The only exception to this may be when someone experiences lucid dreams. That is to say, when one is aware that one is dreaming and possibly able to actively participate in and manipulate the dream experiences. The above presentation of the different categories of the mind is given from the point of view of manifest consciousnesses, actual active consciousnesses. However, it's important to understand that the different awarenesses are not always manifest or present. They can lie dormant. For instance, while we're sleeping, our course consciousnesses are non-manifest non and lie dormant or latent. Similarly, even though we have not eliminated ignorance, anger, attachment, etc., yet this does not mean that these afflictions are always actively manifest. If the external and internal circumstances that usually trigger, for instance, our anger are temporarily absent, our anger will lie dormant or abide in the form of the seed of anger, the potential of anger. 
until the circumstances once again assemble. Here the seat of anger refers to the potential for anger to arise again. Likewise, with prolonged meditation on patience, we are temporarily able to lessen or even overcome our anger. However, since such meditation is unable to eliminate the seed of anger, only the yogi direct perceiver directly realizing emptiness can extinguish the seed. When we discontinue the meditation, our anger will slowly start to manifest again. Therefore, whenever our afflictions are not manifest, they lie dormant, that is, they exist in the form of a seed or the potential to rise again in our mental continuum. The same also applies to positive minds, such as love, compassion, bodhicitta, and so forth. Even if we have cultivated great love and compassion for others, this does not mean that those virtuous states of mind are always present. Unless they degenerate, they merely lie dormant. That is to say, we possess their seeds in our mental continuum and they're able to manifest any time. Um, depending on their intensity, particular minds can also have a strong influence on other minds, even while they lie dormant. This is especially important from the point of view of Dharma practice. For instance, bodhisattvas have cultivated bodhicitta, the intense aspiration to attain the state of a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. This aspiration is so strong that even when it lies dormant, it has a great influence on other minds in those bodhisattvas' continuums. It is the force that motivates bodhisattvas to engage in practices that gradually take them to enlightenment. Therefore, Mayana path are said to be conjoined with bodhicitta, which means that Mayana path, even when bodhicitta lies dormant, are influenced and enhanced by bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, on the other hand, is also influenced, influenced and enhanced by those paths. So also the clear light mind right now, you see I said very little about the, the, the subtle minds, etc. But also the, part of the subtler mind is also the mind lying dormant. It's a subtler version, although it's not really a mind, but it lies dormant. And so um, the clear light mind also lies dormant right now. It's not active right now. Okay. One of the most important examples for this is the yogic direct perceiver that directly realizes emptiness. When this yogic direct perceiver manifests in the mental continuum of a bodhisattva, bodhicitta cannot manifest. And when bodhicitta manifests, the yogic direct perceiver that directly realizes emptiness cannot manifest. However, even though when one is manifest, the other exists in the form of a seat, that is to say, lies dormant, the two awarenesses are still conjoined. They are conjoined because bodhicitta enhances the yogic direct perceiver that directly realizes emptiness, and the yogic direct perceiver that directly realizes emptiness enhances bodhicitta. Does that make sense, this whole explanation? right? So those two minds are not present at the same time. You cannot know emptiness and a bodhicitta at the same time, but they still influence each other. So when bodhicitta lies dormant, it affects your wisdom, when, bodhicitta, when, you have, when your wisdom lies dormant, it influences bodhicitta. So at different times, you train yourself in those minds. That's why a balanced practice is so important, where you don't exclude anything. Because whatever practice you do, it influences the other practices, even while they're not present in your mind. So like I said, this is all part of this explanation of subtler and coarser levels, where it's just the psychology, it's just the way our mind works, where even... Some thought you have in the morning, when that thought, that motivation lies dormant, it influences you throughout the day. So we, we start with the motivation in the morning, we finish with, with um, purification, for the reasons sleep and so forth already mentioned, and for the reason here that some awareness is lie dormant. So, even the, so they become conjoined. Bodhicitta and wisdom can become conjoined because Bodhicitta enhances the yogic direct perceiver that directly realizes emptiness, even though it's not present at that time. But its seed, its potential is there, and it still influences the mind. And the yogic direct perceiver that realizes emptiness enhances Bodhicitta. Bodhicitta enhances the yogic direct perceiver because it provides it with the strength to not merely eliminate the afflictive obstructions that hinder us from being liberated, but also the subtler ones, the smell, the garlic smell, the imprints, so that we can, so that we also eliminate the cognitive ones or the obscurations to full enlightenment. The yogic direct perceiver enhances bodhicitta because it strengthens the aspiration to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay? Therefore, the method aspect of bodhicitta and the wisdom aspect of the mind that realizes emptiness are compared to two wings of a bird of a bird in flight, that even though they do not move syn syn synchronically, synchronously, uh, synchronously. 
How does it pronounce? At the same time. At the same time. <laughs> At the same time. That is to say, when one is up, the other is down. It assists and aids each other. Two birds that they didn't know that. I know, I know, I know. I know, but this is the kind of bird we're talking about. <laughs> Actually, actually, when I wrote this, I got it all wrong. <laughs> I, should, I mean, the, the, so the, 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 they are compared to the wings of a bird. But in my mind, it was like, yeah, one is up, one is down. I was so stupid. I was thinking of like a bicycle or something. So actually, I should say, but actually, the, the difference is to the bird is that they do not move syn- synchronic, like at the same time. Yeah, the, the, they do say no. They do say that it's like the bird's wings, yeah. but they don't move at the same time. One Pardon? One wing is stronger. No, no, no. It's about like one is active and the other one isn't. Alternate. They're alternating basically. So in this case, like bodhicitta and wisdom, they talked about as two words because without both wings. But I should have said, but the other than those wings, they do not move. So I mean, I should have left out the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I have to cross it out and remember to change that because then we yeah, just assist and aid each other. Yeah, not just synchron than ever. This completes a brief presentation of the mind. Wait, wait, wait. Not done yet. Not done yet. Because <laughs> we got something in the in the middle. But it's time now to take your lunch. Now it's eleven twenty four. Um, and we'll continue with the rest during the afternoon and of course tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.